Um, so we're going to go over a couple case histories real quick. Again, my name's Stephanie, um, and I sit in the Nashville district of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I'm an economist, so I'm not saying I've picked favorites already, but... <laughs> Um, I'm just kidding, but we will dive into some case studies. I really do love to go through these case histories, so I hope that you all enjoy it too. Um, basically, we'd go through these case histories to help us sort of get the conceptual picture, right? So help us kind of think through how this consequence modeling all comes into effect in real life. So first, we're going to start with Viant Dam. This one really gets me excited. I think it's really interesting. Um, and it's located in the Italian Alps, so hopefully you notice that boot shape there is Italy. The little red dot up at the top, that's where our location is. Um, basically, Viant Dam empty, empties out to the Piave River, and ultimately that leads to the Adriatic Sea down there. Uh, Viant Dam, for you engineers, this doesn't mean that much to me, but this is a double curved thin arch dam. <clears throat> Construction on this began in the late 50s, and at the time it was the tallest dam of its kind in the world. So from this picture, hopefully when you look at that, you're just like instantly amazed at the grandeur of this project, because every time I look at that, I kind of get like chill bumps. I'm like, that looks crazy and scary. Um, but this was constructed for hydropower by a lead engineer, Carlos Samanza. This was kind of like he's nearing retirement. This is going to be his legacy project. So kind of keep that in mind when you're thinking about some of the ego that may get brought into this later on. Um, and it was nationalized in 1962. So again, the grandeur of this project. So this is 860 feet high. Um, I don't know if everyone else is good with scale. I'm not. The Statue of Liberty, for example, is around 305 feet. So this is double that. So this thing is just massive. The base of it is around 73 feet thick and 89 feet wide. And the crest is around 11 feet thick, 623 feet wide. So we really have this V-shape going on. And as you get to the top, you know, it's getting thinner and thinner. So this is the view if you were on the dam. So if you notice, there is a town just two miles downstream. That is Longaroni. Um, and again, I hope when you look at this, you feel a little scared, like I would not want to live there. Hopefully you would not want to live there either, knowing all the wonderful knowledge you have about flood risk and dam and levee safety risk. And then if you are downstream looking up at the dam, this is if you are in Longaroni, kind of the main um, highway downstream of the dam looking up. So from this angle, maybe it doesn't look quite as scary if you're living in that town, it looks kind of far away. You're probably like, oh, that's not really that much for me to worry about. Again, unless you have some dam and levee safety risk experience and then you're like, okay, I think I'm gonna move. So kind of br uh, brand this particular image in your mind. We're gonna come back to it later. So this is Longaroni. At the time, it was a tourist destination, you know, relatively small village, but popular for people to kind of come visit, um, take in the scenery and all that good stuff. And it's mostly residential and commercial. Again, kind of notice like the stair step feature up there in the upper end of the picture. It looks like maybe some railroad tracks down there sort of in the middle. Um, so again, just take a mental snapshot of this image. So a little bit about our project and the location. So this is, again, Viant Dam, sort of there in the middle. We've got Longarone, again, about two miles downstream. Notice on the left side of the reservoir, you've got two little villages up there called Caso and Erto. And then on the right, you have Mount Talk, which literally means the walking mountain. So again, not to foreshadow anything, but it's called the Walking Mountain for a reason, right? Locals were very familiar that this was known to have creep, to have landslides, and for this mountain to walk or move and shift over time. So quick timeline. So again, this construction started in the late 50s. Um, and then by 1959, at a nearby project, Ponce Dam, there was a landslide there that went to the reservoir. It created about a 65-foot wave and resulted in one life loss. So leading up to this point, they had, um, they had considered some of the risk to an extent. But again, this was sort of a legacy project for Carlos. And so some things were brought to his attention, such as this looks like it's probably an ancient landslide location. Um, and he's like, well, no big deal. Keep moving. Let's keep trucking. Um, and so then this uh, nearby 
Sorry, I probably need to stand closer to the microphone. This nearby landslide happened. One person did lose their life, and so they started doing um, some more thought, or not doing more thought, but they started having a little bit more thought about, okay, this could actually be a problem. Nonetheless, they started filling the reservoir anyways in, the six, in 1960, and by October of 1960, so in about six months here from February to October, Hopefully that math worked out. I just did that in my head. Um, the reservoir was already around 557 feet deep. So again, maybe everyone else is good with scale. I'm not, but I hear 557 deep and I'm like, wow, that's a lot of water. So then going on from October to November in 1960, this project had its first landslide. And at that time, the reservoir was around 600 feet deep. Um, and a third of a mile wide slid off. That's, I think, about six football fields, if that helps anybody. Um, and it created a seven-foot wave over the top of the dam, and it resulted in no life loss. So now at this point, they've had a landslide at a nearby project, and they've had a landslide at this project. So now they don't really have a choice but to kind of think about this a little bit more, right? It's, it's a problem. The public is acknowledging this is a problem. So now they've got to talk about it. So what did they do? So in 1960, after this landslide at Bayant Dam occurred, um, they said, okay, let's stop filling the reservoir, let's assess our risk, and let's start lowering the water levels. Um, so they lowered it to about 450 <coughs> feet, and that took around a month for them to do. And they started building these hydraulic models, so these little physical models to help sort of replicate the project. And they were trying to figure out what is the worst case scenario? Like what's the worst possible thing that can happen here? And then we're just gonna um, adjust our operations of this project based on that. So doing their little physical model, they basically said, okay, as long as we keep the reservoir about 82 feet below the crest, again, this project was, a, I think I said 862 feet high, so around 770 feet. So if we keep the water around 778 feet and we don't go above that, the worst case scenario is there is a landslide, it creates about a 20 foot wave, or sorry, 60 foot wave, 20 meter wave, and it's all contained behind the, behind the crest and we're good to go, no problems. So this is what they decided based on their model and they're like, all right, cool, we just won't, we won't raise the reservoir. During this time, they also did some piezometer readings. Three out of four of those were great. One of those, not so great, and again, um, wanting to keep things moving along, not raise any concern. They said, oh, well, we must have like sort of just messed up that reading, no big deal, let's just ignore it, keep on trucking. So another interesting thing they did, looking at their little physical model and then also just their experience, is they decided, well, what's causing this problem is the question they had. And so they said, okay, well, when we raise the water level, we start to have the creep of the mountain. When we lower the water level, it stops. So some people got together, they're sitting around the room, they say, so we can control this thing, right? Like we can't really prevent a landslide, but we can again, keep the water level low, keep from overtopping of the project, and we can control how much creep we're getting. Again, I'm not an engineer, but to me, there must not have been any economists in the room, right? If someone said to me, I can control whether this mountain slides or not by the water level in this reservoir, I'm gonna be like, yeah, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound right to me, right? But nonetheless, they thought if we lo lower the water level, basically the limestone is gonna anchor to the foundation and we got no problems. If we raise the water level, then we're creating buoyancy more or less, and that's what is allowing the mountain to move. So this is all what's going on in 1960. Got a lot of good brains working together and they're like, all right, we're confident in this. We've thought about our uncertainty. We've thought about all the possible things. We've got it under control. Let's keep going. And they started to refill the reservoir again. So again, this was in 1960. Two years later, they had a large precipitation event. At that time, the lake was around 780 feet deep. So we are right at that level where we said we really shouldn't go above this level, we're there. And they start seeing about a half inch of creep on Mount Talk. Um, so what did they do? They said, all right, we've, we know what we need to do. We did our modeling. Let's lower the reservoir a little bit, get the mountain to stop moving, then we'll be good to go. So that's what they did. 
Um, and that was 1962 to 63. Then let's fast forward to April of 63. And they started to, again, raise the reservoir up 16 feet. Now remember, we were already at 780 feet, which is above or right at where we should not go above, right? So going 16 feet, now we're above that level that we said we shouldn't go above, right? And so why did this happen? During this time, the lead designer, Carlos Samanza, had a brain hemorrhage and unfortunately passed away. So now the new engineer comes on board and he says, eh, I'm not worried about all that work y'all did before. I'm gonna raise this reservoir level level because I wanna generate hydroelectric power. We're gonna do it. So now we're like, we're in the like no fly zone, right? We're already there. We shouldn't be at the water level this high. And so when summer rolls around, they have this massive precipitation event. The lake is at 814 feet deep, so we're above that threshold. This was the highest recorded level ever at Viant Dam. And now we're getting the mountain moving by an inch, over an inch per day. I don't know about y'all, again, like visibly, would I probably notice an inch of creep? I don't know, but that's a lot, right? The, the earth is moving. So again, they start to lower the reservoir and the creep goes down. So now we're under an inch a day. And they're like, all right, good job, guys. We're doing a great job. Let's keep it going. But then September, a few days later, the creep's now up to four to eight inches per day. So plan didn't really go as planned, right? So now we're on option B, which is let's just lower the reservoir. Let's just like, you know, we got we to gotta do something here. So they're attempting to lower the reservoir. By the, uh, the 2nd of October, they are getting over a foot of creep per day. Now I like to just imagine I'm one of the people living in like Casso or Erto, which were those villages on the left side of the reservoir up there. And just kind of like imagine like looking out your window and at the start of the day like there's a little tree here and by the end of the day there's a little tree here, right? Like this is noticeable to the public at this point, right? There's no hiding this. This is a problem. And so then by October 9th we're getting 32 inches of creep per day. That is extremely noticeable, again. So what are we gonna do? So what's going on during this time? Emergency notifications, right? So like think about in your districts or your disciplines, wherever you work, if there is a major flood event coming or a forecasted rain event coming, you've got your emergency managers all on the line. Everyone's in communication. We need to be monitoring this. We need National Weather Service is sending out messages. All this stuff is going on. So we would assume when we know that we're having nearly three feet of creep per day, that would also be going on here. But it was not. And why that was is in 59, again, around the time that um, landslide happened at Ponce Dam, which was nearby, people at Mount Talk, Caso, Erto, Longaroni, they're noticing all this creep and they're getting nervous. And a local newspaper basically publishes this article that's saying, hey, a landslide is very likely here. And what happens? Politics got involved. They said that's fake news. There was a lawsuit involved and it was never talked about again. So no one's saying anything basically is what is happening. So pre-disaster, again, they didn't need um, the hydropower uh, corporation to come out and say this is an issue. They can visibly see that the mountain is moving and a landslide is probably going to occur. So the mayor of Erto, that again was one of those little villages, um, he starts encouraging evacuation to the residents. Uh, but not many of the residents actually complied because they're like, well, they said this is fine. We're way up here. That's way down there. Nothing to worry about. I'm just going to stay home. Same thing um, in Caso. Um, but again, uh, these communities had knowledge of that physical mod modeling that had been completed. And so they're like, well, at the most, there will be a 65 foot wave that will be contained behind the crest of the dam. So we don't really have anything to worry about. 65 feet up, like we're above that, no problem. Um, and again, while this creep is happening, the workers are trying to lower the reservoir to again, anchor the foundation, those limestone, um, the limestone mountain to the foundation and prevent this creep and try to control this landslide. One and a half hours before a disaster uh, looms, 
they say, okay, uh, there might be a little water over the dam tonight, but don't worry about it. Just like keep going on about your day, have a good time. Uh, there was a popular soccer game going on at this community at the time. So people are at like the local pubs, just like having a few beers and cheering on their team and everything's good. They're like, okay, nothing to worry about. And they kind of limited traffic on that main highway directly downstream of the dam. And that was pretty much it. In fact, and they were so sure that their modeling was so great and they considered everything that 60 of the engineers that had been working on this thing said, hey, let's go up on the bridge on the dam and let's actually watch this landslide happen. Like, this is gonna be pretty cool. You know, it's around 10.30 at night. What else are we gonna do? Let's all go hang out, watch this happen. Not really where I wanna be anytime I think a landslide might be occurring, but again, these are the kind of things humans do. We're not always logical, right? So what happens? October 9th, about 10.40 p.m. So you've got people watching the soccer game. You've got people getting ready for bed. A lot of people are at home. And basically a square mile falls off into the reservoir. It took 45 seconds, so less than one minute, for this entire landmass to slide into the reservoir. And it created essentially a tsunami over the top of the dam, um, about 860 feet, 60 feet high. So Caso and Erto, yeah, they, they felt the impacts of this. Um, it's about 20,000 acre feet of water. Again, that's not great scale for me, but maybe for some of you all that is. Um, but they, there were reports that they could hear this landslide and this tsunami in like Brussels, Belgium, so like places pretty far away. And they talk about this as if it was the same sort of force as the Hiroshima bomb. So those villages, Caso and Erto, um, they not only got water up to them, but they also had like this kind of burst, like this force that caused like shattered glass and like debris and all this stuff. So like this was major, right? And I'm looking at y'all's faces and no one looks like just shocked by this. Like is, is anyone, <laughs> every time I'm just like, wow, I'm just like so shocked. Um, and there's a really great documentary, well, I'm using documentary kind of lightly, I guess you, I guess it's a documentary, called Mountain Tsunami by National Geographic. If anyone is watching, interested in watching this, I mean, the video kind of stinks, but it's really interesting, and I will send that to anyone who's interested, but this was crazy, right? What did this result in? Flood depths over 230 feet deep, and this is in Long Garone. So this is in that stream two miles downstream, or this city two miles downstream. And again, two miles, this flooding was able to travel there in around four minutes. And within 15 minutes, the whole town's wiped out. Like the whole thing. What kind of life loss did this result in? So over 2,000 in life loss, that included all of the engineers, all 60 engineers that went up to watch this thing occur. It included 20 um, other technical personnel, 40 people in a hotel on one of the abutments, 158 people that were in those villages on the upper, uh, again, the left side of the reservoir. Um, and this was a 94% fatality rate. And in that documentary, it's kind of interesting. You'll hear a couple of accounts, not, not many, because this was a long time ago, and also not many people survived, but a couple of accounts of people who did survive this. Um, one in particular was this young girl who basically, uh, her grandmother was putting her to bed, just came over and casually closed the blinds, knowing what was coming their way. And she kind of got, in a way, I guess, kind of smushed up in her mattress and they found like her little hands sticking out of the mud somewhere and were able to rescue her. There were a couple of people that were able to sort of just like run upward and escape this, but ultimately like 94% fatality rate. And there were also four other villages um, that were also impacted by this and had life loss. So here's that image I told you to kind of brand into your brain. Um, notice that stair step feature where the railroad tracks were, all those little buildings. I mean, there's just absolutely nothing, right? Like how often do you see something like this? Some more images, again, I know these are kind of difficult, but what I think is so crazy about these images is like, you don't even really see debris, right? Like this force was so strong, it just took everything and kept it moving. Like there was nothing even left in its path. Um, this was nearby town Prago or village Prago. The only thing you can sort of see is there's a little bell tower 
um, sort of in the right center there. Everything else decimated. Here you do see quite a bit more debris, um, but still again, not much. It's kind of hard to tell, but in the center of that image, there's some men standing, um, just kind of scoping out the damage and you know, what are we gonna do now? Um, and this is a more modern image of what that scarring looks like. So it's kind of got this like little M shape, um, but you can still see this if you visited the site today. Um, this image, again, think about the scale of this. This is an 862 foot high dam, which now is just filled with dirt behind it. So like all that was water and now it's just dirt. Again, just wrapping your head around, around what happened here. So what do we learn from this project? Again, stability analysis, we didn't really consider that much. When we had bad piezometer readings, we kind of ignored them. Um, one of the things that, um, that they talk about in the documentary as well is basically when they did their analysis, they failed to, they failed to find this sort of thin clay layer that existed. Um, and that's ultimately kind of what they say led to this failure. If you're a geotech or really into this, there's also um, another RMC employee, Justin Pierce, who's a geotech and does sort of the engineering side of this presentation. And I could get you in contact with him to ask him questions. Don't, well, don't tell him I sent you. <laughs> um, but so basically what was happening was these, this clay soil, when they thought they were raising and lowering the water levels and controlling this, what they were really doing is they were saturating this clay level and then, you know, letting it dry out, which was leading to these cracks and fissures that ultimately led to big cracks and fissures that led to this giant slide. Um, so again, just sort of ignored the fact that this was an ancient landslide location, ignored the bad piezometer reading, failed to do the proper analysis to find this clay layer. We're very confident they had considered everything. Um, so, didn't have a good grasp. I, I think one of the key takeaways I get from this is like, when I think I've got it all figured out, I should probably just like assume I don't, right? Like when you're thinking about your 90% like confidence levels or like whatever terms you put that in, um, be sure that you've really thought of everything, right? Like, and that we're not, we're not conveying um, a lower risk than what is there. Um, they normalized, again, observations. They didn't give appropriate evacuation warning. They kind of hushed the public and hushed anyone who uh, brought up concerns about this. Um, so there wasn't any communication happening with the public and the public was uh, pretty confident that they were safe. Um, another important thing of this is the timing of this event. So again, this was a nighttime event where you've got a lot of people in bed. It's hard to reach them with a notification anyways really didn't have time in this instance to notify them by the point we realized it was a major problem. Um, and so people just aren't as alert at nighttime generally, right? Whereas if this happened in the daytime and I'm standing outside and I say, oh God, like maybe I can run, but maybe not, right? So this is why communication is so important. Um, and to Jason's point earlier, this is a reminder that even if our structures do not breach, there could still be a very real, a very catastrophic risk. So this would be considered a non-breach risk because the dam's still there. And not only is the dam still there, it doesn't, it had no, no effects. Like again, like this just blows my mind that you can have an 800 foot wall of water go over the top of this thing. And I mean, they did a great job at the design and engineering for the stability of this thing, right? Like they did do a great, they did what they were supposed to do but we didn't consider how that would affect, you know, how that could affect people downstream if there was this landslide. So now this is a park. Um, it has not been in operation since then. Um, it's kind of fun if you go onto Google Earth, you can put your little, you know, stick man, if you know what I'm talking about, on the little bridge there and kind of like look around a little bit. It's in a little cage. Um, so it's kind of hard to see, but it's still pretty neat. So recommend doing that. Um, and again, if you're interested in the documentary, let me know and I'll send you the link. So that's our first one. All right, so the next one we're gonna talk about is Baldwin Hills Dam. Um, this one was constructed in the late 40s, early 50s. And it was also built, well, it wasn't also built. It was built to provide um, water supply. Notice uh, the location here. We're in California, really close to Los Angeles. Um, highly populated area, as you can imagine, which we'll see in later images. 
this particular water supply project was on like the tallest hill sort of in the area. So it sits about 400 feet above um, sort of the city streets, I guess you could say. So this is a little bit of a better image. Again, notice all the population downstream. It's a lot of people, very congested. Um, it's about 20 acres, um, 70 feet deep. Um, you can kind of see it forms a sort of ring levee, keeping all the water in. Uh, I should ringed dam, I guess you could say. Uh, and it's 232 feet tall, about 700 feet long, and stored about 250 million gallons of water. So the image, it's a little hard to see, I'm sure, but basically what this image is showing is uh, basically this drainage system that they were building. So basically they knew when they constructed this that there were highly erodible soils underneath that they were constructing this on. And they also knew it was on a fault line. So they said, okay, because of these things, we need to have a really good under drainage system um, so that we're not getting water contact with those soils and creating issues. And so that's kind of what this image is showing here. Timeline. So this one, uh, again, let's go back. I think there were about 14 years. Yeah, so 1951 is when this was constructed. So in 63, we've got our, um, our daily inspection happening. It's about 11 in the morning. I just imagine this guy walking around with his coffee, like just assuming everything's gonna be fine like every day. And he starts noticing um, that there is an issue. There's a little bit of a seepage issue. So he contacts the appropriate people and they say, okay, um, we probably should start lowering the reservoir. It'll take about 24 hours for us to do that safely. Um, let's get moving on that. And an hour later at 1215, they've contacted um, the local officials to basically say, okay, we're gonna be lowering the reservoir. So there's gonna be a little bit of flooding. We need to like start notifying people. In 1220, they actually open up the uh, discharge lines and the flooding begins in those regi residential areas downstream. So they're in this process, they're like, okay, there's an issue, no big deal, we're going to lower the reservoir safely, get the people that would be impacted by this out, we'll be good to go, we'll figure out what the issue is. One o'clock, they started noticing downstream there's some muddy water, so there's a larger issue than expected. So they start attempting intervention. Um, to basically try to prevent this uh, looming breach, right? Uh, and by 1.30, they start doing more extensive evacuation planning because they're like, okay, this thing, this thing might blow. Um, 1.45, they actually officially make that decision and start notifying people to evacuate. Um, 2.20, uh, radio and TV alerts begin. This, they had live uh, sort of coverage of this, which we'll hear some of that in just a minute. Um, and they had helicopters flying around with loud loudspeakers, uh, trying to get everyone to know what's going on. This one's always interesting to me. If I see a helicopter above, I don't. Maybe I just don't hear well. But like, if you're yelling out of me on a helicopter, like to me, I'm just like, oh hey, you know, like what are they doing? You know. So like, I always find that interesting when this is involved in our case histories. Maybe some of you are smarter than I am and would be like, that can't be good. Why are they yelling at me? But. That's just me. Uh, they also are sending uh, actual officers door to door, knocking on people's door. Hey, you need to get out. Um, and so there's a lot happening. They're, you know, they're pretty confident this thing is going to blow, and they're doing everything they can to notify people and get them out of harm's way. 2:20, um, the water is, you know, going down, and they're able to see. Oh, there is a three-foot breach here. This is a major problem. Um, by 320, their evacuation efforts have been going relatively well. They've got 1,600 people out of harm's way. Or sorry, they've got 1,600 people. Most people have left, and they only have about 1,600 people left in harm's way, I should say. Did I do that backwards again? Yeah, 1,600 people have left. Sorry. 1,600 people have left, um, which is pretty good, right, considering, uh, considering how quickly this is sort of developing. And at 338, there is a blow, mud and debris going everywhere. The water is rushing downstream. So if you have not left at this point, you are in trouble. Um, and then importantly, um, around an hour later, the entire thing is empty. So again, we talked about how much water was in that thing, about 20,000 acre feet, I think is what I said. Um, that, that's a lot of water and it is all gone. 
So let me uh, show you some news footage here. I love that video because why does it sound sort of like a Disney narration? I don't know, but um, I would much prefer someone to not show me a flyby of everything and be like, hey, you should get out of your house if you're listening to this like right now. Like just, you know, just go, just, just go right in a second. But, you know, pie shaped, it's a pie shape. Like that sounds so nice and it was not nice, right? So again, we'll talk more about communication and how you communicate these things later, but I always find that interesting, you know, the, the, pleasant music in the background and the calm voice, but maybe that's better than what I would do, which is scream, so. A triangle-shaped wedge tears out of the asphalt and concrete lined wall of the earth-filled dam of the Baldwin Hills Reservoir. The water fills the 50-foot deep catch basin below the lip of the dam, and millions of gallons of water race down the canyon toward the homes below in the community between downtown Los Angeles and International Airport. These spectacular scenes are made from a KTLA helicopter. They show a wall of water, 30 feet high and 100 feet across, sweep homes, everything in its path, wiping hillside terraces smooth as though with a giant mop. Almost 300 million gallons of water in 77 minutes. An incredible disaster. Automobiles are swept up like toys. Many are wrapped around trees like a giant pincers put them there. Expensive homes on upper levels and then more modest ones on lower slopes feel the mud brown surge. From the ground or water level, this is the scene when the water begins to drain away. The views of the day cameraman flies close up to where the reservoir cracked open, and we get a graphic view of the area of greatest damage, a pie-shaped section about one square mile, with the reservoir at its apex. Bisecting the piece is the giant furrow carved in minutes by the great surge which banned out at the end of its downhill run. Up to 10 inches of mud covers everything in the path of the water. We see what is left of 250 damaged or destroyed homes and apartment buildings. Undetermined thousands of persons worn by reports of a leak in the dam hours before it burst fled to spend the night at homes of relatives or in evacuation centers. Because of this, the human toll is light. Three lives reported lost. Damage is reported to be at least $10 million. A four square mile area of 9,000 homes below the reservoir is declared a disaster area, making residents eligible for low cost reconstruction loans. Most homeowners here do not have flood insurance. 5,000 tons of muck is scraped from streets and property. Federal, state, and city authorities investigate the watery disaster, but for the stunned residents, there is only the prospect of a grim year end. Okay, so some key areas downstream. So the uh, box with the one there, that was the location of this dam. Um, you kind of notice sort of uh, this little tunnel that goes from one to two. So two, that's Cloverdale Avenue, which was shown in that video. We'll see some more pictures on it later. And then three, we've got Village Green Apartment Complex. I'm pointing these out because this is some areas of life loss. Um, and also just, again, to point out the residential nature of this area, how how really um, urbanized this particular area was downstream. Um, and I wanna show you this video because I think it's easy to sort of lose uh, context of like terrain and that sort of thing, which this isn't perfect, but this kind of gives you an idea um, of how this water was getting funneled uh, through sort of this little canyon sort of area to those residential areas. So you're getting, now you're basically channelizing all that flow, which is going to lead to what? Higher depths and higher velocities. So just to kind of give you an idea of terrain there, again, this was about 400 feet above these communities and all getting channeled through this one little narrow section. 
So this is Cloverdale Avenue, what I believe is Cloverdale Avenue. I believe they said they report there were um, different sort of guesstimates, I guess, at how high the water really got. I think around here they were saying around 30 foot feet of depth. Um, but just notice this is extremely turbulent flow. You could see in the images there, you've got cars being swept away. You've got just chunks of stuff floating downstream. So this is obviously a very high hazard situation. Um, and also, again, take a screenshot in your mind of this image because we're going to come back to that in a later slide. This image, you've got the dam is in the upper part of this image. And so uh, this, you're kind of seeing some of the receding flow. So notice how it's channelized sort of through this street in the middle and then also to the right over there. Um, around 210 structures were flooded and 65 of those were completely destroyed. So collapsed, um, washed away, no longer there. Um, and this is looking upstream towards the dam. So you kind of, again, black and white images are difficult, but that's what we have from this time. And so you're seeing that giant rupture there. It only, again, took about an hour and a half for this thing to completely empty. Channeling all that water. I like to just emphasize all these points. Channeling all that water into a residential area. So this is Cloverdale, what I believe is Cloverdale Avenue again. Um, and notice, you know, you're, you're able to see sort of the what I assume is like water or sewage line, something like that. Um, you've got these deep goalies. This house is gone, basically. You're not going to be living in there anymore. So this is the kind of havoc that was wreaked in this area. Um, here you've got uh, a, a man just kind of looking out over the damage. You can see some major machinery sort of in the center there in the back. Um, about 11 million in property damages. So significant um, economically for sure. So a quick summary, so this is opposed to Viant Dam where it's happening later in the evening. This one happened on a Saturday um, during the day. So you've probably got a lot of people out and about, a lot of people at home, maybe they're doing yard work, maybe they're just like going shopping, who knows what people are doing, but people are out and about um, and they're tuning in to radios, they're tuning into TVs, they're able to receive warnings more effectively because they're awake. Um, so pre-evacuation before we I warned anyone we had about 16,500 people in this area and of those most people were thought to leave we had about again a thousand I think I said in the earlier slide around 1500 people still remaining in the area so relatively effective at getting people um, away from harm um, this a thousand to 1500 people that were remaining we call that exposed par so population at risk would include people who at the onset of an event have the potential to get flooded and then exposed part are those who actually are inundated areas when the event is occurring. Do not get out of harm's way. Um, so importantly on this one, um, and we'll talk more about topics, uh, the topic of rescue later on throughout the week, um, but there were quite a few rescues in this particular event. Um, the fire department itself did helicopter rescues. We'll see some sort of um, interviews of some of those here in a later slide. Um, and that was in that village green area, which was box three on my earlier slide. So sort of that apartment complex there. There were five fatalities total. Three of those were all traveling in the same vehicle. Vehicles, again, we'll talk about this later in the week. Vehicles are a very dangerous place to be um, during a flood event. Um, so three people were in that vehicle and then there were two others unrelated, um, which we'll talk about. And there were several hospital hospitalizations from this. Um, and a relatively low fatality rate. Again, uh, you're able to stream sort of this live coverage of the event. You've got people knocking on your door. You've got helicopters flying overhead. So there were a lot of ways you've got people out and about and they're able to be receptive to these communications. And so pretty good, um, pretty good evacuation process here. Um, You'll see this uh, sort of timeline. We'll talk about this a lot. This is kind of the timeline um, Jason was talking about. Uh, Dr. Bowles had sort of helped create along with others um, that takes us from the time that we realize there is a potential problem to the time people evacuate safely. So basically, just as a reminder, around 11.15, we said there's a potential problem here. It took us three hours to say there's a big enough problem. We need to evacuate all these people. And then when people receive that warning kind of varies, right? It depends on how you're receiving communications and what access you have to those and it has to you. <clears throat> so some of the fatalities, um, 
The first and the last bullets here are uh, basically those two that were not in the vehicle. So both of those were um, gentlemen in their 70s, uh, which relates to human stability, which I'll be talking about more this afternoon. Um, but basically, uh, in this second bullet, you see um, a daughter was kind of recapping what happened for her parents in this event. And Archie, gentleman of about 71 years old, was trying to get his wife and himself evacuated. He was able to get his wife outside. He went around uh, to go lock the front door. Um, again, no one wants their stuff stolen in the middle of a flood event. Again, this is how we all think. We read it and it's like, oh, I would just kind of leave, but no, I would go lock my front door too, right? So he like, they're evacuating. He's like, wait a second, I'm gonna go lock the front door. Gets to the front door, gets swept away. His wife was basically able to cling onto a tree um, and was ultimately rescued. And then the other one, the third bullet here, uh, they found another gentleman. His daughter also kind of recapped the event later. He was a retired executive and uh, basically he got swept away as well. I like this first one because basically some policemen went to this house to tell them they needed to evacuate and then they got trapped at the house as well. So if I can't help you get out, what should we do? We should carry your organ upstairs and all of your glassware upstairs to prevent it from getting wet. So, you know, if you gotta be in a disaster, might as well try to get some stuff elevated. So I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, I just imagine like I go to your house, you know, I'm an officer and I'm like, okay, you need to get out. Oh wait, now I'm stuck with you too. And then you asking me to help you move furniture you know that would just it's just interesting right and then let's see the second bullet there that's the one we talked about on the previous slide as well um, the next one they found one woman perched on top of her piano again that talks about humid stability and submergence criteria which are all factors in our modeling which we'll discuss more in depth later but being able to get on top of something to sort of protect yourself cling on to something um, again, in the next bullet point, you see a lot of the motorcycles, patrol cars, the people that were trying to help evacuate ended up needing rescue and help themselves. Um, and I like this last bullet too, because no looting occurs is that last statement. I always think that's fun to point out because that's always like one of the number one things you hear of in flood events, like, you know, there's looting going on. And I like how proud they were to say no looting happened, you know. Some more accounts. So the first one, uh, you've got two elderly women that are basically clinging onto a fence. A helicopter comes, rescues them. The next one. So this one was, this one like blows my mind, right? Because they actually go to this house and rescue two infants, like are just kind of handed up these two infants um, into their helicopter. Like, I'm not a mom, but I have nieces. And it'd be really hard for me to like, you know, part with my child, but of course you'd have to do that, right? So that's, I imagine that was difficult and also very uh, scary, right? Um, the next one, they had some people, they were trying to land uh, on the garage, which was becoming quickly dangerous for them. Basically, he says, I took a gamble. We did it anyways. We got the people. So like also, you know, you have to consider when rescues are occurring, it's not only unsafe for the people who are stuck in the floodwaters getting rescued. It can create very hazardous situations for the people who are doing rescue. Um, and then the next one is again, two older women who are basically clinging on to another fence. Um, it's kind of unclear if this bullet and the first bullet are related. So I present them both anyways, but um, again, just clinging on for dear life. And then that one, that one's interesting as well, because you see um, that bottom statement there. This is the kind of decisions people have to face, um, which is he had to leave one man standing on his roof to go get these other two women. So it's like when you're assessing the situation and you're thinking about who do I get first? How do you prioritize people? How do you prior prioritize who life matters, whose life matters more? Um, these are very difficult decisions, right? Okay, so this is the view from the reservoir. Um, I like this picture a lot because notice the vehicles are some gentlemen standing there. That gives you an idea of the scale of this thing. You know, when I look at those first pictures, I'm like, oh, that's, that doesn't look that scary. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, this is terrifying. Um, and basically what they determined happened here was there was a, uh, uh, basically a six foot sort of differential between the west and the left side of the liner here. So basically there was a crack, did this little number, that fancy liner that they worked so hard to develop so that water didn't come to, in contact with these erodible soils, failed. Um, it's kind of unclear uh, how this actually occurred. There's multiple trains of thought. One is that 
because there was that fault line there, there was just some sort of, you know, activity along the fault line that result that caused this. There's also um, thoughts that potentially when they were doing construction, all the heavy machinery on the liner and in this area caused this. Um, there's also some thoughts that potentially because they were doing some, um, that's where I'm looking for it, hydraulic sort of fracturing nearby that could have caused some of this. So. Not exactly clear, but ultimately, again, we had this great plan. We built a project where we probably shouldn't have, but we're like, we're smart, we're good people, we've done our homework, and we messed up again, right? And this project also is no longer in use. It is now also a park that you can visit. Um, and I think, uh, I said Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area. I feel like it's kind of changed what they call this area a couple times, but not rebuilt and... Here we are today. So I'll leave you that with that. Thanks everyone.